34 and full year FY20 earnings conference call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star 10 0 on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Sudhir Singh from Investor Relations of Mbago. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you and a very good evening or morning to everyone. I hope uh, you all are safe and in good health. Uh, on behalf of Indalco Industries, I welcome you all to this earnings call for the fourth quarter FY20. On this call, we will refer to the Q4 investor presentation uh, available on the company website. Of the information on this call uh, may be forward looking in nature and be covered by the safe harbor language on slide number two of the Q4 earnings presentation. In this presentation, we have uh, covered briefly our action towards maintaining safety, operational stability and liquidity in the COVID-19 environment. Later on, we have presented the key highlights for the fourth quarter and full year 2020 and a comparative financial analysis of our business segments in India and our overseas subsidiary novelists. All the prior period numbers have been regrouped and reclassified as per the India and presented in a similar manner for comparison purpose. On today's call, we have with us from Indalco's management, Mr. Satish Pai, Managing Director, Mr. Praveen Maheshwari, Chief Financial Officer and CEO of uh, Copper Business, from Novelis' management, we are joined by Mr. Steve Fisher, President and CEO. I, will now like, I would now like to hand over the call to Mr. Satish Pai for his opening remarks. Thank you and over to you, sir. Uh, thanks, Shubir, and uh, greetings to everyone. Um, thanks for joining the conference call of Hindalco for fourth quarter FY20 earnings. <clears throat> Before we discuss our performance for the quarter, let me start with a, a quick update of our actions related to the COVID-19 pandemic on slide four. Our first and most important objective has been to protect the health and safety of our workforce across all our facilities. We have taken several precautionary measures which will remain in place until the pandemic crisis is resolved. Employees at our offices in metropolitan areas have been asked to work from home as much as possible. Non-essential business travel has been suspended. Stringent safety measures are in place, including social distancing at workplace, sanitization of all premises, getting people back to office in stages, and stress testing our preparedness through mock drills. We are also active in the surrounding communities with drives for distribution of masks, sanitizers, PPEs, and food. Now turning to our operation, Hindalco's four aluminum smelters and the Utkal refinery in India operated at near full capacity during the lockdown. Our coal and bauxite mines also operated at regular scale. We are exporting more than 80% of our total output to countries like Korea, USA, Malaysia, Brazil, Japan, while minimizing our inventory buildup and absorbing the plant fixed costs. Our aluminum downstream plants in India had shut down initially except for two that continue to operate and serve essential sector customers. We have since restarted downstream operations at reduced capacity to meet the existing market demands. After initial temporary shutdowns, our copper operations have restarted and are now stabilizing to reach optimal levels. Temporary or partial shutdowns were taken in Novellis automotive plants across the region due to customer shutdowns, reduced demand or by government decree. The plant schedules are being adjusted to be in line with latest customer demands. All CAPEX, excluding maintenance and essential CAPEX for the next year, is being curtailed in India and Novellus. All businesses are focusing on fixed cost reduction and maintaining adequate liquidity to sustain plant operations in the current environment. Coming to slide six, let me now present the key highlights of our quarterly performance for Q4 FY20 versus Q4 FY19. Indalco delivered yet another steady and strong quarterly performance reflecting its resilience to withstand market cycles. This performance was driven by record financial performance by Novellis, coupled with lower input costs and stable operations in the Indian business. 
To begin with, Novellus net income without exceptional items was 153 million, up 18% year on year. Novellus reported its highest ever quarterly adjusted EBITDA of 383 million, up 7% year on year. It also recorded its highest ever quarterly EBITDA per ton of 472, which is the best among global peers. Novellus continues to maintain its strong liquidity position of 2.6 billion as on March 31st, 2020. In April, Novellus completed the LRS acquisition and the integration process has started to drive synergies and long-term value. Moving on to Hindalco India Aluminium business performance in Q4 FY20. EBITDA for Hindalco India Aluminium, including Utkal, was 1,039 crores, up 3% year on year, despite a challenging business environment in Q4 FY20. The EBITDA margin was at a healthy 20% and probably the best in the industry currently. The business recorded highest quarterly aluminum metal production of 327 kT, up 2% year on year despite COVID related challenges. Aluminum metal sales were at 314 kT in Q4 FY20, even though domestic market conditions were tough. Sales of aluminum value added products excluding wire rods was at 76 kT, down 8% year on year due to the lockdown impact. <clears throat> Utkal Alumina delivered its best ever production of 441 kT in Q4 FY20. Muri Alumina Refinery has restarted operations in December 19 and was ramping up to strengthen our integrated value chain. The Utkal expansion project of 500 kT is on track and expected to start in Q4 of FY21. Turning to the copper business quarterly performance in slide number seven, copper EBITDA in Q4 FY20 was 406 crores, up 9% year on year with a mar margin of 9%. Value added CC rods touched a record quarterly production of 71 KT and grew by 15% year on year. VAP sales were at 73 KT, up 4% year on year, with the share of VAP to total sales reaching a record high of 86% in Q4 FY20. Overall copper metal sales in Q4 FY20 was at 86 KT in FY20, down 14% due to lower dispatches in the month in month of March due to the lockdown. The benchmark TCRC for calendar year 20 has settled at 15.9 cents per pound, which is 23% lower than the last calendar year. Now let's look at our quarterly consolidated performance for the year. Hindalco's quarterly consolidated EBITDA was at 4,173 crores in Q4 FY20, up 6% year on year compared to 3,938 crores in Q4 FY19. Consolidated EBITDA margin stood at 14% in Q4 FY20 versus a margin of 12% in corresponding quarter last year. The consolidated profit before tax, before exceptional items, was 1,395 crores in Q4 FY20 as compared to 1,725 crores in Q4 FY19. The PBT has an impact of Rs. 568 crores of the one-time finance cost in Novellis. Consolidated profit after tax in Q4 FY20 was 668 crores compared to 1,178 1, crores in the corresponding quarter of the last year, also impacted by the 568 crores of one-time financing costs in Novellis. In January, Novellis successfully issued 1.6 billion bonds at 4.75 due in 2030. To replace one of the existing 1.15 billion bonds, at 6.25 that was due in 2024. This offering extends the debt maturity profile at an attractive rate with a net interest savings of around 17 million Panara. Indalco reflects a strong cash position at the end of March 31st, 2020 in Novalis at $2.4 billion and in India at around 9,900 crores. 
The consolidated net debt to EBITDA stands at 2.61 at the end of March 2020, as against 2.48 at the end of March 2019. Now turning to the broader economic environment in slide 9. Global lockdown measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19 are severely impacting economic activity. IMF has IMF's April forecast of minus 3% contraction in global GDP growth versus 2.9% growth in CY19 is much worse than the 2008-9 crisis. Both the emerging and developed economies are expected to grow, degrow in CY20 with the contraction expected to be more severe in de developed economies. These forecasts are subject to downward revision in case the pandemic rolls over to the second half of calendar year 20. The impact of this pandemic was visible in Q1 calendar year 20 GDP growth numbers with the US, China and the Euro area GDP contracting minus 5, minus 6.8 and minus 3.3 respectively. Easing of lockdown measures in most countries and the announcement of fiscal packages by various governments are expected to provide some boost to economic activity gradually as the world learns to live with the virus. The shape of the recovery, U, V, L, will however depend bearing on how effectively these fiscal measures are implemented across the various countries. The key risk to watch out in 2020 will be the escalation of US-China tension and its corresponding impact on global growth in calendar year 20 and 21. Turning to the Indian economy, GDP growth in Q4 FY20 slowed to 3.1%. As a result, the full year FY20 GDP growth fell to a 11-year low of 4.2%. This slowdown was primarily due to degrowth in manufacturing and construction sectors. The full impact of lockdown will be visible at the end of Q1 FY21. As most people do as most monthly indicators are in the red in April 20. On the positive side, however, as a part of the Unlock 1.0, India has started easing some restrictions from 8 June and is restarting economic activities. This, along with the government's economic stimulus package of 10% of GDP, is expected to revive growth in a calibrated manner. On the Monetary Policy Fund, RBI's benchmark policy rates now stand at a record low of 4% with cumulative rate cuts of 115 bits in 2020. Let me now take you through the aluminium industry overview on slides 10 and 11. Global consumption growth in 2019 declined by 1.6%, the lowest level since the global financial crisis of 2008 and 9. The prolonged U.S.-China trade war and sluggish industrial activities across regions dampened consumption growth during the year. In 2019, demand in the world excluding China contracted by 3.5% versus a growth of 2% in 2018 due to subdued demand in regions, notably U.S., Italy, Japan, and South Korea. Chinese demand was flat in 2019 as compared to a 4.1% growth in 2018. Across regions, slow growth in end-user industries such as automotive, construction, electrical power, and machinery and equipment were the primary reasons for the significant drop in demand in 2019. In Q1 of calendar year 20, in the backdrop of COVID-19, global demand has declined by 9.3%. On the supply side, global production declined by 800 kT to around 63 million tons in calendar year 2019, as Chinese production declined by 3% on account of disruptions at two major smelters, whereas in the rest of the world, production grew by 1% in 2019. The overall market deficit in 2019 was around 1.1 million tons, as against 1.3 million tons in 2018. Global demand in 2020 is projected to fall sharply by 8% in the backdrop of the COVID-19 outbreak. The world excluding China consumption is likely to contract 13% due to severe slowdown in manufacturing, particularly in the automotive sector and due to weak customer sentiment. In China, 
demand is likely to decline by 4% with some green shoots due to recovery in demand led by auto and construction. Global aluminium prices witnessed a significant decline of 15% in 2019 to 1,791 per ton versus 2,110 in 2018. In Q1 of calendar year 20, the average global aluminium prices have declined further to 1,690 per ton. Coming to slide 11, in FY20, domestic demand for aluminium declined by 6% to 3.7 million tons. Imports, including scrap, degrew also by 6% on sluggish demands in the domestic market. Despite degrowth, imports maintained the market share of around 58% in FY20. Domestic sales declined by 6% to 1.55 kt, 1.55 million tons in FY20. Domestic demand registered a consecutive, a, a consecutive decline of 11% year-on-year to 905 kT in Q4 FY20. Imports, including SLAP, also recorded a degrowth of around 4%. Domestic sales also sharply declined by 19% year-on-year to 376 kT in Q4 FY20. The continued slowdown across all user industries, such as electrical, automotive, building and construction, were the primary reasons for the sluggish growth in consumption during the quarter. Domestic demand for aluminium in FY21 is likely to continue to be subdued. The government's recent announcement of a stimulus package of 20 lakh crores and its trust on infrastructure, housing and electrical sectors will help offset the negative economic sentiment post-COVID to some extent. Moving to slide 12, the global FRP demand in the near term will remain soft in the cyclical and markets resulting from the COVID pandemic. In the current situation and post-COVID, industries like beverage, food packaging, pharma will tend to benefit, leading to a higher demand for FRP in these segments. Beverage can sheet market has historically been a recession-resistant product and is expected to remain resilient in the current environment particularly in North America and Europe. With the rising preference for sustainable beverage packaging, aluminium will continue to drive demand for beverage can sheets going forward. Currently, the global automotive industry has seen adverse effects due to COVID-19, as some automakers had temporarily ceased production. Aluminium FRP demand for automotive body sheets, driven by light waiting trends in the transportation sector, premium vehicles and EVs continues to see traction and some positive signs of revival with growing demand for automotive, majorly in the US, Europe and China. While the major US and German automaker restarts are some positive signs for the automotive market, but broadly speaking, it's still unclear as to how much the COVID-19 will impact overall near-term auto demand. In the aerospace segment, reduction in production is seen as consumer travel is expected to drive lower demand in the next year. FRP growth in the aerospace segment, though, remains intact with high order backlog from all, all air aircraft manufacturers across the globe. Domestic FRP demand in India is contracted by 9% in Q4 FY20 and by 3% in FY20 year on year. Due to subdued demand in transportation, building and construction, and electrical sectors. Currently in India, industries like food packaging, pharma, beverages, and litho are pushing domestic demand for FRP, and this is expected to grow further post COVID. Turning to the copper industry on slide 13, global refined copper consumption contracted by 0.7% in 2019 versus a growth of 2.9% in the previous year. In China, consumption growth moderated to 1% in 2019 versus 5% in 2018, whereas consumption in the rest of the world contracted by 2.3% in 2019 versus a growth of 1% in 2018. This drop in copper consumption of the world ex-China was driven by weak manufacturing activities in Europe, majorly Germany. 
In Q1 of calendar year 20, owing to, owing to COVID-19, the global copper consumption saw a dip of 10% versus the same quarter last year. All of this degrowth has come from China, which dipped by 22%, while the world ex-China grew growth remained flat for the quarter. <clears throat> On the copper concentrate side, mine disruptions in 2019 were comparatively high. Copper concentrate consumption grew by 1.6% to 16.8 million tons in 2019, compared to a growth of 3.1% a year ago. Concentrate market recorded deficit of 168 KT in 2019, versus a surplus of 141 KT in the previous year. Owing to the lesser demand by smelters in China as an impact of COVID-19, copper concentrate consumption saw a dip of 2.7% in Q1 calendar year 20. This has led to a temporary rise in the spot TCRC from 11.5 cents per pound in Q4 calendar year 19 to 15 cents a pound in Q1 calendar year 20. Going forward, uncertainties related to COVID-19 and other macroeconomic environments across the globe are going to impact, impact copper consumption in calendar year 20. At the same time, various stimulus packages declared by different countries may provide some support to overall copper demand. We expect the global demand for refined copper to be around 22 million tons in calendar year 20 down 5.5% compared to the last year. On the supply side, COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the southern hemisphere in a big way, and many large mines, especially in countries like Peru, Panama, etc., have already declared force measure. We expect the copper market to be in a deficit of around 400 KT in 2020, and will put further pressures on the spot TCRC. In the domestic market, the consumption of copper recorded a marginal growth of 2.5% year-on-year in financial year 20 to 750 KT. Sluggish demand in FY20 can be attributed to weak demand from transportation and the power sector. Post-imposition of CVD on import of wires from Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand and Vietnam, shares of imports have reduced to 32% in Q4 of FY20 and this was 52% in Q3 of FY20 and 37% in Q4 of FY19. This uh, will certainly help domestic producers to increase their market share going forward. Praveen will now take you through the business performance highlights of each of the business segments in Q4 and the same year. Thanks, Satish. Uh, let us review our operational performance on slide 16 now. Nominus delivered yet another strong and steady quarterly and full year performance in 2020. Nominus registered its best ever adjusted EBITDA and EBITDA per ton for the quarter as well as for the full year 2020. Kanchi shipments were 66% of the total product mix in FY20 versus 63% last year. This remarkable performance was on the back of strong operating and financial performance supported by favorable market conditions. Overall shipments for the full year were 3,273 KT in FI20. Beverage can sheet shipments grew 4% year on year in FI20, driven by rising consumer preference for sustainable packaging. All the organic expansion projects in the US, China, and Brazil are progressing well. On April 14, 2020, Novelis completed its acquisition of LRS and has begun integration of their operations to drive the synergies. The divestment procedures for automotive assets at Lewisport in the US and Duffels in Europe are underway. This acquisition will provide further product diversification with addition of high-end aerospace and expanded specialty capabilities. Recycle content utilization in Novelis continues to be high at 60% in FY20, and Novelis has a very strong liquidity position of $2.6 billion with cash and cash equivalents of $2.4 billion at the end of March 31st, 2020. 
Moving to slide 17, related to financial performance of Novelis. Novelis achieved a revenue of $11.2 billion, an all-time high adjusted added of $1,472 million, up 8% YOY, and a record EBITDA per ton of $450 per ton, up 7% YOY in FI20. This growth was on account of portfolio optimization, favorable metal prices, better cost efficiencies, and favorable foreign exchange, but partially offset by less favorable recycling benefits due to lower aluminum prices. Slide 19 shows the details of the performance of Indian aluminum business segment. Alumina production in Q4 FY20 was 720 KT and 2,735 KT for the full year 2020. Utkal refinery achieved a record production both in Q4 and the full year FY20. Mori refinery has also started operations in December 2019. The aluminum metal production was at a record high of 1,314 KT in FI20, despite some disruptions in the month of March due to COVID. Valuated products, excluding wire rods, recorded a production of 79 KT and 319 KT in Q4 and full year 2020, respectively. Coming to slide 20, aluminum metal sales volumes were at a record high at 1290 KT in FI20, up 1% YOY. This was achieved despite challenging market conditions. In Q4 FI20, metal sales were 314 KT versus 325 KT in the previous year, down 3% YOY only due to the COVID impact. Value added product sales, excluding wire rods, were lower by 8% at 76 KT in Q4 on account of low offtake in the month of March 20 again due to the pandemic. VAP sales in FY20 was higher by 2% YOY at 306 KT in FY20, which share of VAP in total sales maintained at 24% in FY20. Moving on to the financial performance of the aluminum business on slide 21, this segment recorded a revenue of 21,749 crores in FY20 versus 23,775 crore a year ago, lower by 9% on account of lower global aluminum prices. EBITDA in Q4 FY20 stood at 1,039 crores versus 1,010 crore in Q4 FY19, higher by 3% year on year. The EBITDA margin in Q420 was at a very healthy 20% of revenue, despite the current challenging macroeconomic business environment. EBITDA in FI20 was 3,729 crores for the full year versus 5,096 crores in FI19, lower by 27% due to lower realization, primarily partially offset by lower input costs and better efficiencies. EBITDA margin for FI20 was at 17.1%, one of the best in the industry. Moving to slide 23, the overall copper metal production was lower by 16% YOY at 75 KT in Q420 compared to 89 KT in Q419, while quarterly production of CC rods was higher by 15% YOY at 71 KT in Q420. CC rods achieved an all-time high production of 263 KT in FI20, up 7% YOY. BAP production was lower by 8% and 24% YOY Q4 and full year respectively, compared to last year. Coming to slide 24 on sales volume of copper and its WAP, copper metal sales were lower by 14% year-on-year at 86 KT in Q420 due to lockdown impact and 7% lower year-on-year year at 335 KT in that full year 20. Although the copper value added, which is CC rod, its sales were higher by 4% in Q4 and 6% in full year 20. The financial performance of the copper segment is on slide 25. Revenue stood at 18,533 crores in FI20 versus 21,198 crores a year ago down 17% primarily due to lower LME and volumes. 
EBITDA stood at 4 and 6 crores in Q4 FY20 versus 373 crores in Q4 19, higher by 9% year on year despite challenging market conditions. The full year 2020 EBITDA stands at 1276 crores versus 1683 crores in FY19. This was lower by 25% primarily due to lower volumes and realization. Turning to consolidated financial numbers for the full year 2020 on slide 26, Indalco reported a consolidated revenue of 1,18,144 crores and an EBITDA of 15,536 crores, profit before tax and exceptional items of 6,208 crores and profit after tax of 3,767 crores in full year FY20. The detailed quarterly comparative financial numbers are attached as an extra to this presentation on slide 31. Hindalco India business reported a revenue of 40,324 crores, EBITDA of 5,483 crores, and profit after tax of 958 crores in FY20. These details are provided as an extra to this presentation on slide 32. Let me now hand over the call to Satish to give you a brief on our concern on the So let me conclude with some uh, key takeaways of today's presentation, which is really about uh, navigating through the current crisis while retaining our focus on the value accretive long-term growth plans that we have. Our top priority is protecting the health and safety of our employees and communities community, taking all the precautionary measures and creating essential infrastructure in all the plants locations for contingencies. Our early preparedness and appropriate actions are helping us manage this tough and uncertain situation well. Second is our relentless focus on efficiencies and cost competitiveness as Hindalco smelters continue to be in the first quartile of the global cost curve. Capacity expansion at the Utkal Alumina refinery will further help in reducing our overall integrated cost of production going forward. The company is focused on cash conservation and maintaining adequate liquidity to sustain plant operations in the current environment. We will tightly control CapEx for the next year while prioritizing only essential CapEx to maintain the balance and ensure future competitive readiness. Our business model of being 80% LME delinked in terms of EBITDA and our long-term strategic investments in Novellis and the Indian downstream expansion will enhance our capabilities. In addition to this, the acquisition of Alaris will provide further product diversification in Novellis to strengthen our long-term sustainable business model. We continue to manage the current situation with agility and we believe that with all the support from government and our employees, we will come out of these challenging times together stronger than ever. Thank you very much for your attention, and we now open the forum for questions that you may have. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Indraji Dagarwal from CLSA. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. A few questions from my side. Uh, first, the government announced the composite auction of the coal and bauxite money. Do you think you'll be interested in that given that we are almost 100% integrated on bauxite? And do you think it will lead to higher mental capacity addition in India, per se, by uh, newer players? So, uh, the whole point of the government doing this is to ensure that more capacity comes in. Now, the timing of that capacity is going to be important because India today produces about 4 million tons and consumes nearly 3.7 to 4. But if there is a, a growth rate, if you can even assume 6 or 7 percent, the government is fully aware that in five years' time, we are going to be importing a lot of aluminium, and hence they are trying to make it attractive. So, as you say, I think Hindalco at this stage is not looking to expand. 
but I think that, you know, they have announced it. It's going to take them a while to come with a package of a bauxite and a coal mine together. And I think that probably this will only happen, in my opinion, probably a year or two years down the road. I think that initially you are going to see some commercial coal blocks coming up for auction. And we'll be certainly looking at that first. I think the combined thing will take them some time to actually get the specifics to make it happen. Thank you very much. Uh, on copper, we have seen a significant jump in margin. So how much of it is due to the spot that we see is increasing and how much of it do you think will actually taper down through the course of so the rest of the fiscal year? Yeah, so I think I need to explain this point a little bit. In copper, there is a concept of derivative accounting that we do. As you are aware, copper is a business which is uh, fully offset hedged. And we have two kinds of exposures. One is the commodity exposure, and the other is the currency exposure. When we buy copper concentrate, it is a it is more like a three to four month cycle before which we actually get the concentrate, we process it, and then sell it. So to avoid any uh, you know undue gains or losses due to uh, commodity price fluctuations, we sell on the exchange when we buy uh, copper concentrate. And similarly, when we sell physically, we unwind the hedge and thereby compensate either gain or loss on the exchange. So the amount of gain that we make on the commodity, on the uh, on physical side, is offset by the loss on the derivative side and vice versa. And the same thing applies on the currency side as well. We use buyer's credit as a hedge against our uh, dollar liabilities. And that's how we, we are able to safeguard ourselves. The issue that is there is, uh, while it is true economically that there is no gain or loss coming from these derivatives that we take, and therefore we are completely safeguarded, in accounting it does not exactly follow the same method. Because the derivatives and the physical side do not go hand in hand in each month or in each quarter. So in a particular month or a quarter, you might see some fluctuations in profits and losses coming in because of this fact, whereas on the longer horizon, you will not see any major difference, which means the gains and losses will actually cancel out each other. Now, this gets accentuated in times when the commodity prices are moving wildly. So if you notice in the last six months, the commodity price, copper price has gone up and down from the high of $6,000, $6,100 to a low of below $5,000 as well. Similarly, uh, rupee dollar exchange rate has uh, widely fluctuated in the last few months. These create noises in the accounting which reflect in the form of a higher gain or loss in any particular month or quarter. Now, in this particular mo uh, month and quarter actually, the last quarter, we saw some significant gains coming from purely derivative accounts, accounting. In our opinion, this gain is roughly about 100 crores, which is which has flown into the books. It is not as if this gain is not there. It is there, but there would be some countervail countering loss sitting somewhere else, either in the previous quarters or in the future quarters. So I would say the real performance of copper should be taken as about 300 crores, whereas in accounting it would be reflected at about 400 crores. Thank you for the elaborate answer. Uh, last question from one side. Uh, when you mentioned that it will be only maintenance capex this year, can you quantify how much of it will be? And will there be any capex on the fiscal expansion? Yeah, so the, on the Hindalco India side, um, we have uh, cut the capex down to 1500 crores. Our original plan was around 2200, 2300. And the 1,500 crores has got about 350 crores of the total expansion. So if you really look at it, our normal maintenance capex along with some other smaller projects should be around 1,000, 1,200. So we have dramatically cut our capex back down to that maintenance plus very important projects, which are either environmental or maintenance related, and the Utkal expansion. And the rest we are postponing a little bit. Thank you. That's all for my question. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management will be able to address questions from all participants, we would request you to please limit your question to two at a time.
The next question is from the line of Anuj Singla from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, so, Mr. Pai, uh, firstly, if you can talk about how the aluminum division has done on the COP side in this quarter and what is the outlook going into uh, maybe FI21 or the first quarter of FI21, given that there is a lot of tailwind from the coal side, uh, given uh, improved availability from coal India. So, any, any color will be useful, sir. Yeah, so I am trying to remember the last time I had said that probably Q4 COP will drop another 2%, actually drop by nearly 5%. So uh, we Q3 to Q4, the COP dropped by 5%. And we now know, because we're already in the middle of June, in Q1 it's going to drop another 5% from Q4 levels. So we are seeing a lot of tailwinds on the cost of production side. Uh, coal is certainly a biggest one, but also CP, coke, pitch, caustic, all of them are quite safe. Furnace oil, everything is quite favorable right now. Okay. Uh, that, that's useful, sir. And, sir, in, in terms of hedging uh, uh, for the aluminum side, would you have an update for FI21 again, sir, or what kind of uh, uh, hedging is already in place? Uh, yeah. This is a standard question, so I'm prepared for that. <laughs> of course. For FY21, we have actually been quite active. We have 38% total commodity hedged at $1,732 per ton, out of which 2% is a rupee LME at $1,70,640 per ton, and 36% is only commodity at $1,711. And the currency overall is 37% hedged at 75.93, so nearly 76. Okay, wonderful. And, and so lastly, uh, on the Utkal side, like you said, the five, uh, 500k expansion is going to be commissioned this year. So is there scope of portfolio optimization in the alumina, uh, among the alumina locations, including maybe, uh, you know, uh, the high cost locations like Muri, uh, where at the present alumina prices, I don't know if uh, these locations are still profitable. So can you share some thoughts on how the alumina ramp up uh, is going to uh, impact your overall alumina sales and uh, maybe cost savings in that division? Yeah, I think that, you know, I think we have said this before. We'll probably ramp down first the Renukut refinery because that's uh, uh, more than the cost. I think cost of Renukut and Muri are not too different, but the red mud space available in Renukut is very tight. So as soon as we get more uh, uh, alumina from uh, Utkal, we will probably ramp down the Renukut refinery more. So that is our plan. So uh, between Muri and Renukut, we will reduce the production to what makes sense. Because we still want to keep a little bit of an insurance policy. I don't want to be exposed to having all alumina from one place. Understood. Reduce the concentration risk. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Understood. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Thanks, Anuj. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pinakin Farik from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, sir. So my first question uh, is on Novelist. Um, uh, over the last uh, two, three weeks, uh, there has been uh, a lot of news flow in the U.S. Uh, while some auto companies had really started operations and shut down again, uh, when the make uh, auto sales number came out in June, uh, they're shut ahead of uh, expectations, and it seems that uh, the shutdown in production sales did, and therefore the inventory chains in U.S. auto is sharply lower. So at this point of time, sir, can you give us more color on how is will this, uh, the key segments uh, in specialties uh, in uh, autos and also a lot of key segments tracking in terms of demand vis-a-vis uh, -vis what in uh, May months? Yeah, sure. Steve, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think, um, as you've highlighted, uh, Pinnikin, uh, in North America and Europe, we've seen uh, all the auto uh, customers or our customers start to uh, resume operations, um, and, and demand is consistent with that expectation of refilling the pipeline and, and getting all those up. There's been starts and, starts and stops as it relates to COVID and so so forth, but overall uh it's starting to ramp smoothly. 
Um, in Asia, auto um, is uh, running very strong um, uh, from a production standpoint. Uh, there is strong demand in Asia for domestic premium EV and SUV uh, segments, uh, as well as we're picking up a little bit of extra demand uh, because of some of uh, supply chain issues from European uh, supply uh, from European OEMs from supply chain disruptions coming from Europe. Um, when you start to talk about the other segments, CAN, um, as uh, Satish highlighted in his uh, prepared remarks, is a recessionary resistant um, segment overall and is holding up very well in uh, North America and Europe and, and, and strong in the other regions as well, although a little bit more affected uh, due to uh, COVID uh, related lockdowns. Specialties is a mixed bag. We see some strength in uh, North America as uh, North America starts to unlock uh, from uh, COVID. Uh, some strength in Europe, both from uh, opening up of the economy, but also some new segments that we've been able to move into. And again, uh, in uh, Asia and, and South America, uh, still a little bit weaker um, uh, in trailing uh, the two larger uh, regions for us. And then finally, with aerospace, I think uh, aerospace itself, um, uh, the, the order backlog uh, as we entered into COVID-19 was very strong. I think we still have to monitor the uh, overall uh, medium to longer term outlook as it relates to aerospace and ability for the airlines to actually procure planes, uh, requiring the build of the planes themselves. And so that's something that we continue to monitor um, uh, throughout the next uh, you know, several months, several quarters. Uh, I'm not sure. This message is uh, acquisition. Sorry to interrupt you. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Parikh. Your voice is breaking up, sir. Can you please check on that? Sure. Uh, just to go back to the Alaris acquisition, there was a, a certain synergy number that was uh, expected. Now, uh, does the COVID-19, uh, you know, disruption mean that the synergies will get pushed out to next year or year after? Or do you expect, uh, management expects to, you know, get as much of the synergy number as was expected in FY21 itself? Yeah, so um, the synergy numbers um, actually will not change. Um, maybe they'll be a little bit slower only from the aspect of ability to uh, capture them uh, with the remote working environment that we're in right now. But the synergies are more your traditional type synergies um, around procurement, supply chain optimization, SG&A, some operational efficiency. efficiency. These aren't top line revenue uh, synergies that we were looking for. So um, there would be no change in the outlook for the synergies um, as it relates to our ability to capture them. Understood. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Amit Dipshit from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my question and uh, congratulations for good performance. Uh, I have a couple of questions. The first one is on your coal sourcing mix uh, in this quarter and uh, how it is likely to pan out considering that, you know, Coal India's availability has improved. So will you uh, be using less coal from your own mines? And if you can also throw some light on coal costs per GCB. Okay. So Q4 already we uh, were taking a lot of uh, coal from Coal India and not from our own mine. So the mix was 60% linkage. 35% e option, 2% from own mines, and 2% imports. That was our Q4 mix. I think in Q1, I doubt whether we'll import any, so it's going to be largely uh, Coal India linkage and uh, auction. And we are, uh, you know, on the sort of rupees per million kilocal at the, the low 900s right now. Okay, uh, thank you. The second question is essentially on uh, standalone balance sheet. So if I uh, look at the standalone balance sheet, you know, your uh, short-term borrowings have gone up compared to last year, while payables have uh, fallen. Uh, so is, is it specifically a quarter phenomenon or is it going to be this way as we go here? No, no, there is no quarter phenomenon here. Basically, in March end, because of the sudden lockdown, we uh, drew on our working capital lines. And that is why you will see while short-term loans have gone up, the treasury balance has also gone up. Actually speaking of the net debt, there is no uh, deviation, frankly. 
So it's purely March last week actually we drew on the working capital lines. That's the reason why the liabilities are they were the short term loans are higher. So we we went to a net cash position. If you remember my uh, uh, talk, around 9,900 crores by drawing down working capital lines. So we just got ready for in case there is any uh, prolonged crisis. Thank you. We lost the line of the current participants, so we'll move to the next question. The next question is from the line of Sumanga Nevatia from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, good evening. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my first question is uh, uh, with respect to the whole year aluminium beta, which is uh, roughly around 3700 crores. Uh, do we have a rough number as to what part has come from our risk management activity with respect to forward booking, etc.? And given that uh, the gap between spot and the future hedges uh, which you shared is now much lower than what our position was at the start of FY20, I mean, what is uh, the loss in terms of uh, profitability we are looking at on an annual run rate basis in FY21? Sorry, I... I couldn't get the question. I mean, uh, uh, I, I, sorry, can you please repeat? I, there is no yeah, loss no, sure, sure. FY21 because of our hedging. Actually, if you look at the hedge position as I was giving, for FY21, we are 38% hedged at 1732. So we'll only be at an unrealized loss if LME costs 1732. Uh, Mr. Pai, is it possible to share what would uh, uh, we would have gained in FY20 with respect to our hedges? Uh, any rough number in terms of crores, absolute number? It's around 1,000 crores. But this okay. is not just commodity. Huh? We hedge, just so that you know, aluminium, the rupee, we, we do furnace oil by taking oil, uh, uh, crude as a link. We do... Um, uh, coal also. We do coal. So we do quite a lot of hedging for various input commodities. Huh? Understand. But out of this 1,000, only LME uh, related would be 5,600 crores. Is that a rough, uh, correct ass assessment? I think I've given enough. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, that's fine. But by the way, if you, every quarter I give you the hedge position, so you can uh, calculate it. Huh? This sure, is a standard. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, so next question, uh, I mean, assuming that we are not uh, hit with uh, phase two of COVID, is it any rough ass assessment on the volume loss we would have in FI21 across the uh, copper, aluminium, and then Novelis? So I'll let Steve answer Novelis, but let me tell you this. In India business, I think the total loss in volume I just estimated will be hardly 15 kT. And that's because, you know, uh, we just turned down the production a little bit on the current for April and May. So we are not going to see much volume loss in aluminium. And in copper, actually, it will be flat. It will be flat because last year's production was not that great at 320 kT. We had hoped to do more this year, but the two smelters were shut for April, May. So we have lost two months of production. But the volume for copper will be flat year on year. And aluminium will probably be, we did 1290 sales, we could be at the most 15 kT down from that. Uh, Steve, you want to just give the, your estimation on Novellis? Sure. Um, it's, it's a little early because ours uh, uh, also um, depends on in-market demand uh, after we recover from COVID uh, across the world and how demand returns um, based on economies uh, across the world. Uh, obviously, as I said before, uh, in the early part, uh, first quarter, uh, almost all, of, I should say, all the North American and European uh, automakers were shut down, which will have a impact uh, on us. They started to recover um, in uh, the second part of this first quarter, and we continue to see that ramp up, and uh, ultimately we need to see what the demand looks like. When we look to Asia, uh, Asia recovered very quickly from an auto standpoint in China um, and continues to see some strength going forward, but still uh, some, some uh, areas for us to look at uh, in, in the outer second half of uh, this fiscal year for auto. CAN, I said, is recessionary uh, resistant and is holding up quite well, so we don't see a material impact in the CAN business. 
and in specialties, a little bit more of a mixed bag across the world. Uh, again, probably more dependent on in-market demand, uh, but so far we see uh, overall uh, uh, fairly solid uh, return of demand for specialties in the North American and European market. Understood. Thanks. And uh, 